And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a little bit of basics. You can jot some notes. And then if you have questions along the way, that's the best thing to do. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll move along pretty quickly, but please don't hesitate, no dumb questions. Um, we're gonna start off, you know, just with something as simple as like, what is wine? And, uh, you know, basically wine is, uh, you know, just like any other fruit, once you break the packaging of the fruit or the skin, yeast that's in the air starts to, to touch with the sugar. And there's a, the most natural thing. If we just took a bunch of grapes, we stepped on them here and we left them be for a couple of days, we'd pick them up. We'd taste them, they'd, be, they'd have a little bit of fizziness to them. They'd be a little bit sour, they'd be starting to get sour a little bit. And it's really, it's a perfectly natural process. So it's very simple on the one hand, but that being said, it's really one of the most complex subjects. So don't worry about knowing everything because it's just like anything else. Um, if you've got a great attitude and a great way of presenting things, and we're gonna give you a couple of tools that'll make it really easy for you. And at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with not knowing the answer to every question because there's questions you could ask me right now that I won't know the answer. It's people study their whole life about wine and there's still things they don't know about it. That's what's fascinating about it for me. So um, the big difference between the grapes, you know, the, the, the ones you get at the store, believe it or not, what do you think, sweeter or less sweet? Less sweet. Yeah, kind of surprised to me because they taste so sweet when you eat them. But the, the grapes you used to make wine are unbelievably sweet. And if you think about it, they have to convert all that and they still have to have fruitiness and they still gotta make usually between 12 and 14% alcohol when it's fermented where there's no sugar left. So there tend to be much bigger uh, pips, the little seeds inside of it. And, and most of the table grapes have kind of, the seeds have been bred out of it. So it's real natural there. Um, vintage, basically that means the grapes, the year the grapes are harvested. And you will find some wines that don't have vintages on them. And that typically means, like for instance, if, you, if you're a champagne lover, most of the bigger champagne brands and the most popular selling are what are called non-vintage. And, and I don't like non-vintage because they all come from vintages. I like multi-vintage better. What it means is they're blending fruit and wine from different vintages. Wine. Yeah, yeah, and the blended wines, they don't have to be from different vintages, but they often are. And, and you're absolutely right about that. And in fact, if you taste the same wine uh, from the same vineyard with the same ripeness, harvested about the same time with the same barrels, with the same winemaker in the same facility, they taste different because of the season but also because of the age. One vintage is invariably behind the other. So wine has like a beautiful bell-shaped curve and some of them are very sharp bell-shaped curves. A lot of the whites, you don't wanna be drinking them five or 10 years down the line, though there's exceptions to the rule. And some of the reds have a really, you know, long bell curve. And when I'm t talking about the middle, it might be 10 years old at that point, you know? But again, the beautiful thing about wine is every one of us, if we taste the wine and we honestly don't listen to anyone else and we just write what we think about it and whether we like it or not, chances are we're all gonna think it tastes different. And some of us are gonna love it. Some of us are gonna say, ah, oh, it's okay. And some of us are gonna hate it. it the year, yeah. The year on the bottle is the year that the grapes were picked. Harvested, yes. Okay. And, and that's often different, give you an example. Barbaresco, you have a beautiful Barbaresco if you take a look on the list yes, under the, yeah, pass those lists around. Um, that's an example like Barbaresco is generally not released until the third year after the harvest. So if you pick the grapes in 2015. Yeah. Right. It would be released in 2018 or later. With the 2015 year. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have a question for you. Sure. Can you explain to my staff about why sometimes at the end of the wine at the glass, there's the fruity on, at the end, because people tend to say, well, they never seen that before, or that means that's a bad bottle of wine, and it's not. The, the what, I'm sorry? The, the fruit at the end of the glass. Are you talking about like a little bit of sediment? Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's a great question. And, and, and you'll find this, it used to be with beer too, you'd have a big problem selling beer that was bottle conditioned. In other words, when the wine is put into, or when the beer, to use an example, 
um, is put into the bottle. There's still some yeast in solution and it falls down to the bottom and, and it's, it's called the lees in wine. Basically, the, as the yeast dies and other things, over many years, the, the color and the pigmentation will fall out of the wine and it'll cause a little bit of sediment. Perfectly natural. What that means generally is it's a wine that hasn't been manipulated and hasn't been killed with technology. And what I say by that is your big mass market wineries, typically they have to worry that somebody's gonna put it in the drugstore window, it's gonna be vibrating, it's gonna get sun, it's gonna get hot, it's gonna get cold. It's everything about it is gonna be opposite of the way the wine should be handled. So they have to put a lot more uh, uh, chemicals into it to make it survive. And they have to give it a lot more treatment um, and, and what they do, unfortunately, in that case, and again, it's always an opinion thing, but in my opinion, they strip a lot of the flavor and a lot of the integrity out of the wine. Yeah, so the, the, the good news is it's perfectly natural, not something to worry about. And once in a while, you'll see actually, rather than the sediment, you'll see like crystals. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's a- My that, mom does that a lot. And yeah. I see customers yelling at me that that's a bad bottle of wine. I'm like, trying to explain to them that no, yeah. there's, there's nothing wrong with it. Right, right. Well, here's the thing is, and I'll tell you how that happens. They call them, some people will call them wine diamonds. Basically, when you're making wine, you do with white wine, it's called cold stabilization. And this is probably too much information, but just so you know. Um, and what they do is they chill the wine down to about 28 degrees for about two hours. And then all those tartrates, which later form those crystals, they fall out of solution. So if the wine gets below, let's say 30 degrees for any length of time, that's gonna fall out of solution and it's gonna become like a little crystal. The wine still tastes fine and it's not like it's sharp enough that it would hurt you or anything like that. But occasionally in Ohio, as you can imagine, you know, wine that's getting shipped, sometimes a red wine, and they don't do this with red wine, by the way. Again, unless it's a real manipulated red wine. They don't do it because it does take a little bit of the depth and the richness out of the wine. So, and typically red wine is not served that cold, so they don't have to worry about it. Whereas white wine, we always serve it cold. So if they didn't do, bless you, if, if they didn't do that, it would fall out of solution in the refrigerator. Every time you put the bottle in the refrigerator, it would happen, right? So with red wine, they typically don't do it. So if in route, or let's say you took it and you put it in your car trunk and you stopped and went to a movie and then you got home and the wine, the red wine in your trunk got cold enough for long enough, it formed the crystals. And then you drink it a month later and there's gonna be a little bit on the cork if the wine was stored on its side. If it was stored standing up, it's gonna be on the bottom of the wine. But again, I'm, Honestly, for me, it's a sign of a minimally processed wine. So for me, it's a good thing. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, so great question, by the way. Okay, so then we, we talked a little bit about the vintages, and um, then we're going to talk a little bit about grapes. So if you go, uh, if you go to the next page, um, we're going to have styles. And as we're going through there, <clears throat> excuse me, as we're going through there, you might take a look at the wine list and you might say, okay, what category do I think this, you know what, and if you don't mind, pass one of the wine lists down for me as well. I know, I know most of it, but. Can I ask you a question about the wine list? Yeah, sure. Am I safe in saying that if a customer asks me, and sometimes they will, they'll say, hey, is, is it uh, lighter, to, uh, uh, drier on the bottom, like the reds? Yeah. Like the last ones are gonna be the driest? Is that, is that how we put this wine? Yeah, well, what we did... I don't, I don't like a dry wine, and what I do is then, well, I say to myself, yeah. I'm not going to like one of the last three. Right. So I try to get them toward the top or the middle. And yes, that's a good rule of thumb, but let me say, with the sparkling wine, it's kind of, we got it set up the opposite. We've got it set from dry and light body sweet. to sweet and, okay. and fuller body in the white. So like for instance, and, and the rosé is kind of the exception to that particular category. But the Moscato, if you guys have ever had the opportunity, world's best Moscato, I believe that. 
um, which is kind of funny for somebody who's in the business to be so excited about Moscato, but it's really good Moscato. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. And Davide Rivetti has been here and done a couple dinners here, so he's you know, kind of entrenched in the whole uh, culture here. But basically you're going from uh, sparkling, you know, off dry with the, the Prosecco. It's dry to most people, but to somebody who drinks bone dry whites, it's got some fruitiness and a little bit of sweetness to it. But then Pinot Grigio is a lighter body, dry. And then as you go through, they're gonna get a little fuller bodied, a little bit more aromatic and a little sweeter. That's the white. Now, when you go down to the red, it's gonna go again from lighter bodied, and this ties into your comment earlier. Most people think of like depth and richness and concentration. They think about that as being dry. It's not always dry, but a lot of times that's how people describe it. If they like a big dry red wine, you know, it's usually gonna be something towards the bottom. Even though technically the Chianti, dry in the real world means the absence of sugar in the wine. But here's the thing is if you've ever had sweet and sour dressing, you think to yourself, if it doesn't have the sour, it would be horrible. But the sour kind of counteracts the sugar. It gives it a balance. So, you know, there are some wines that you could perceive as drier, even though they have sugar in them because they have real bright acidity on the counterbalance. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like if you forget the if you forget the vinegar in the sweet and sour dressing, it's not too good on the salad, you know. I mean, unless you like honey on a salad or something like that. But I mean, you got to have that counter. So, so my theory is somewhat right. Yeah, okay, it's, so it's right. absolutely. Okay, so if somebody <clears throat> asks us, then that's how we can kind of gauge. Yeah. Based on what they're looking for. Yeah, and they're you know why, generally speaking. It's very it's very strategically organized in that respect. So if someone says, oh, I like lighter bodied reds, you'd want to recommend from the first three or four maybe. If someone said they like real full bodied, you know, then you'd be going. The only difference here is the Dornfelder is a sweet red and that's kind of an anomaly um, in the sense that most red wines are dry, whereas quite a few whites are sweet or off dry. So the Dornfelder is a sweet red or a fruity red. You can describe it as well. well a Red. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to, I mean, again, it's, it's not technically, you know, correct, but it's a great way to explain it. You know what I mean? Because then they can relate to it immediately. Like, exactly. that's what I would like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so exactly. So when they say they, they want something sweet, I say, I tell them, I go, I have a red, it's almost like a Moscato red, but it's a red wine. And they're like, they go for it. Yeah. As soon as I say that. Absolutely. And, and if I may, on that subject, I always like to say, like I can talk to you all night long about the wines or all day long. I won't though, I promise. Um, but a taste is always the best. I always say a taste is worth a thousand words. If, you've get, if you get somebody who's a little bit, you know, not sure what they want, I would always say, bring them a little taste. You do a lot of things with that. Anytime you offer somebody, you're basically telling them, I wanna make sure that you get what you want. I mean, who doesn't like that, right? I tell them I tell them to do a little wine tasting. There you go. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the thing. It's, it's such a nice thing. And later on, we'll talk about reciprocity um, with sales techniques, and you'll see how that'll tie back into that. But um, the point is, is a lot of times when you bring them a glass after you tried to, because everybody describes what they like differently. So you bring them a glass and they think, ah, oh, it's, it's okay, but they're not gonna complain. You know, they've already asked you five questions about the wine and they don't hate it, so they're gonna drink it, but probably slowly, right? Yeah, no. So much better to bring them a taste. And if they say, oh, that's a little too sweet, well, then you go a little higher up the list on the whites, yeah? And if it's not sweet enough, you go a little, yeah, you get it, right? And then you get something they really enjoy and then they have a second glass. And then while we're on the subject, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit, but feel free to take notes on timing. It sounds funny, but timing is really critical when it comes to not just wine, but all drink service and things like that. The reality is, is a table cannot drink 
a drink that is not within their reach. You know, I mean, I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but think about it. So let's say they order a glass of wine or a bottle of wine and you're, you know, you're a little busy and you're taking, you know, hot food always takes priority. I mean, it has to, right? But let's say five, seven, eight, nine minutes later, they still haven't had their drink. Now, it's not that everybody's gonna get mad about that, but some will. But that being said, they don't have any chance at enjoying that and drinking that. So you've kind of basically said, whoa, we're not gonna let you have a second glass of wine because we're not gonna get you the first glass for 10 minutes. So the sooner you can get them uh, one of her beautiful martinis or a glass of wine or a bottle of wine or a beer or even a, you know, a soft drink, the better because they can't consume it until it's in front of them. You know, again, I know it sounds crazy, but it's, it's like, and then the second part of timing, very critical to get the second bottle sale or the second glass sale before you put the entrees on the table. It sounds a little bit crazy, but believe me, just to let you know, my background is not just in wine. I mean, I'm, I'm currently writing a little like how to avoid knucklehead moves, but I call it, I call it from the dining room to the boardroom. So I'm writing on that. So I started in kitchens, but, but now I'm thinking it should be from the dish room to the, because that's where I started. I started as a pot scrubber and then dishwasher and then worked my way up through restaurants. And then I went to culinary school. So I've been in the restaurant business for a long time and I've seen a lot of people and how they sell things. So once the entree is in front of you, you look at it, you see it and you're kind of satisfied a little bit and the temptation is to to make do with what you have at that point okay but if you were to come a few minutes earlier and say oh i just checked in the kitchen your food's going to be up shortly it looks like you might need a refreshment on the wine or however you like to say even something like would you like to change to a different wine to go with the, the entree whatever you're asking them at that point and then even if that even if at that point you've taken the order and then the chef's like bang the, the food's up you know and you got to run the food because the you know, and I don't know do you have a runner I no Okay so so maybe a runner's going to bring it out but the point is is you've got the order they're not going to say now they might say if if 10 minutes later you don't have it to them they might say oh just cancel the line but you understand it's it's psychologically very important that you ask them before the entree comes down and of course, if they've already drank their glass, of course you ask much sooner than that. But you wanna anticipate their next move. And their next move, if their glass is pretty low, is that they need some more wine or they need another drink. I mean, it sounds, again, silly. And then one other comment, if you'll bear with me on the dining room. I will say the secret to being a great server is eye contact in the dining room all the time. I know it sounds crazy again, but it amazes me sometimes when someone will have forgotten something or I need something and they'll be, you know, servers just walk into the dining room, but nobody's looking around. And it's like, people will tell, you'll know immediately if a table needs something. And if they get desperate enough, they might start, you know, this kind of thing. They don't want to do that, believe me. And it drives you crazy because you don't want them to do that. But if you got your eyes open and, and, and one last thing on that, don't be afraid to look at other people's tables too, because at the end of the day, you're all kind of like franchise owners in the same business. And if he does a fabulous job, then they're gonna come in the next week and you may take care of them and they give you a nice tip. And then if you do a great job, then they're gonna come in the next week. Now, on the, on the other hand, if he does a terrible job in the first place, I'm picking on him because he's been here a while. Um, then he may, you may not get the chance to serve him. You may not get the chance to serve him. And then at the end of the day, you know, we're all here to kind of, you know, take care of the people, but you can't take care of the people if they don't want to come here, right? So again, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm just saying just simple things like that, like eye contact, they'll tell you. And body language too is another thing. You can tell when people are, you know, when, they, when their body language changes, even if they say, oh, no, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. You know, sometimes you got to dig a little deeper. So anyway, 
Um, back to this. So on the categories here, the styles of wine. Um, give me an example. I'll make. I'll give an easy one. Who's who's the newest person here? Okay. Okay. So a couple. All right. Well, all of us kind of. A lot. Okay. A lot of. Okay. Okay. So sparkling. We see here. We see sparkling on the category. Sparkling white and pink pink selections. Okay. So sparkling is the first selection, and that's the prosecco. Would it would be it would be now it's not and again i'm glad you brought that up because you know what you should be teaching this thing now <laughs> you no it's good it's great yeah but the thing was is i would have i would have had to do one of two things i would have had to break off just a completely and i will tell you once in a while people will order moscato dosti and they won't know that it's sparkling because there is moscato out there that's not sparkling but uh, Again, usually anytime I've had them order it and then say, oh, it's sparkling. And you say, you know, but it's incredible, you know? So the point is, is I could have done one or two things. I could have kept it right behind the Prosecco, but then it would have broken the sweetness rule. So that's why we did it the way we did it, okay? But that's a great, that's a great point right there as well. Um, dessert. Yeah. Talking about Moscato, when you um, offer this as a dinner um, dessert um, wine, because I've done it before, but they have, yeah, dessert wine. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, and that's exactly what I was going to ask. Like, what's an example of a dessert wine? And you could say the Moscato would be a great dessert wine, but that being said, there's a lot of people, that's all they drink. My mother, my, my beloved mother, um, that was her favorite wine. You know the Moscato, and uh, and she would drink. She would drink it with spaghetti. She would drink it with dessert. She would drink it with appetizers. She would drink it with whatever. I she liked it. it as a port wine. Yeah. Because you know they wanted a after dinner wine, so I made, you know took the wine glass and I did Moscato. Yeah. And they loved yeah. it. And what again, is a port wine? I had someone ask me last night yeah. for a port wine, and I ended up bringing them. What you sent, you sent me the door yeah. and they were happy with it. They were happy or yes. what? Okay, good. Um, I thought you did have though. We did. We okay, did. didn't we sell enough sell. of it. Okay. okay, yeah. Yeah, so port wine, just so you know, is from Portugal, hence the term port. Okay, it's a fortified wine. So as they're making the red wine, what they do is they add brandy to the red wine before it finishes fermenting. The brandy takes the alcohol up high enough, it kills the yeast and stops the fermentation. That's how you only get a smaller amount of it because it's higher in alcohol. It's generally very sweet and very high in alcohol. So it's well, typically, wine, yeah, wine, typically wine, served, wine, yeah, two, wine. three ounces typically. Yeah. Right. Was it a, yeah, that was also small. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. So the thing is, is it's, 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 we, we have tried having those and there wasn't, the problem is, is a bottle like that will last a little bit of time, but if you don't sell it within a couple of weeks, it's going to start to get yeah. bad. I mean, port lasts longer. And honestly, most of the fortified wines, believe it or not, the, the reason they survived to this day or the reason they developed was the lack of refrigeration and the lack of ability to transport things quickly. So port could go all around the world. And the Portuguese, if, if you know your history, were great explorers and were great navigators. So they would take the port wine all around the world and it, you could take it in a ship. And there's those that swear to their death that port is not great unless it's gone around the world in, in, the, in, the, in a ship. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny, but there's people who will, that's, and it's the change of the temperature, it's the change of the season, it's the change of the humidity. So there's maybe some truth to it. Um, we used to do a cognac back when I was able to sell in a previous market, when I was able to sell um, high, high proof spirits as well. And it was a tour de monde, which meant that it had gone around the world at least once before we would bottle it and sell it. And it was extremely expensive, as you can imagine. 
Okay. Would you say that's more of a rare wine or a small selected wine? Yeah, you know, it's it's not rare in the sense that there's not, not a lot enough. of it produced. There's right. plenty of it, but it's it's going to be a relatively unusual rare request. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and and especially in a Italian restaurant. Okay. Yeah, because don't get me wrong, there's some restaurants that will sell a significant amount mm -hmm. of pork. And in fact, we have a, a little place that we like to go to in Tampa called Burn Steakhouse. And they have this whole separate facility that just, you go there for dessert. And then they have usually like between 150 and 200 dessert wines. So Michelle loves desserts. And if it was up to her, she would rather have the dessert before the meal. Yeah. But we will go there and it's amazing. Like there'll be, you know, all these different Madeiras, ports, sauternes. And if you like that kind of thing, it's really kind of like a treasure chest. But that's one restaurant in the world that I can say has that amount of those type wines. Yeah. So it's going to be relatively rare. But now, now you know, what would you recommend for that if they said that? Ask me that question again. I'm sorry. Yeah. If they said, if they asked you for a port right now, you would say, you know what? Oh, I don't have it, but the Dornfelder, Dornfelder is a very good replacement. Yeah, yeah. May I bring you a taste? Yes. You know? And that's kind of what we did last night. Right. And it, it worked Perfect. Out. So. Another thing, um, Kixie makes beautiful sangria, too. So oh, that could be a, occasionally, if you want someone who wants a sweet, fruity red wine, that could be a nice alternative to offer them as well. You okay. do red and white? white. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if, um, just a thought. I mean, it's not really like port, but. Right. And it's our ingredients, so we right. can use the fake stuff. There you go. There you go. And again, things like that, um, you know, those are really great things to say. Oh, you know, our, you know, Kixie in the bar, have you met her? I mean, here's the other thing. Well, we're going to get to that. We got to keep moving around. I don't want to keep you guys too long. Okay, so. So light bodied white. Why don't you give us a light bodied white? Um, Pinot Grigio? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so Pinot Grigio is gonna be probably the one Italian white that everybody knows. But it's kind of like an everyday light, easy drinking. And uh, Tolo happens to be really cool. And if you want a little, just a little tiny thing to mention, you know, just say Tolo's got 150 families right in the heart of Abruzzo that put their love and all their resources together. And believe me, if you can get 150 Italian families to agree on anything, it's amazing. You know, there's the people who say you can't get an Italian brother and sister to agree on something. So, you know, so they put their resources together and they make some of the most beautiful wine in central Italy. I mean, really, and nice, nice people too. Okay, so if someone asks for a rosé, what would you recommend? Yeah. Oak Grove. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, so let me throw a little curveball at you. So light bodied red. Light bodied red. Would also be the Pinot Noir, right? Pinot Noir. Would, noir. Yeah. It's a hard one to pronounce. It's a hard one. Yeah. Noir. Think of film. Think of film noir. Yeah, yeah. So like we have two and of those, so how would you figure out which one they want? Well, that's what's interesting is you not only have two of those, you yeah. have really, I would dare say, those first four wines would fall into that category. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I would say to them, uh, what I would say to them is I would say I would go with one of the Pinot Noirs or one of the Tuscan wines, and. I bet you've never had a chance to try our Fossilia Super Tuscan. It's a blend of 50% Sangiovese, which is the main grape in Chianti, and 50% Merlot. And it's like drinking velvet. I mean, it's, I don't it know. Sounds really good when you say it. Like <laughs> really, yeah. 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 Can you just write this all down and just Whoa. give us a little cheat sheet? Yeah, take, take, take some little notes. But, but here's the thing is, you know, find just something fun, like, either reading or when, when we're talking today, find something that catches your interest. And that sounds kind of, you, you can't give them three, four, five minutes. So we're gonna give 50%? 50% Sangiovese uh -huh. and 50% Merlot. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Fossilia is named after all the fossils that are in the vineyard. 
and it's amazing. Um, and on, on the front of the bottle, have they converted to 2015? Yeah, but there's the fossils on both bottles, right? Yeah, so the bottle, there's a fossil on the front of it, and that's really literally from the vineyard. And as I was walking around the vineyards, I noticed all these fossils. That part of Tuscany was under the Mediterranean Sea for a long period of time. Yeah, and then the volcanoes kind of pushed it up out of the, yeah. So it's pretty cool. That is cool. And it's different. Yeah. yeah. Can I just add one little thing along with what Coco was saying? That, you know, my famous saying is always, we don't want to be bothered as servers. We don't want to be order takers. Mm -hmm. oh. So all of you guys, and, and some of you, like, I try to learn wines. It's like, it's, it's just above me. I just can't put a grasp on it. But to your point, if you guys could come up with maybe three or four little spiels that you know, if somebody asks this, you're gonna give this, they say, then all of a sudden you're creating a dining experience. Mm -hmm. Like you got with my friend at the Buddha. Carly came over, said this, that, that, and this, mm -hmm. something about this, and by the way, what are you having for dinner? This, mm -hmm. recommend this, but I don't like whites, well great, then we can go to this. So if you have like a little spiel like yeah. in your back pocket, all of a sudden, Instead of selling one glass at seven dollars, you're going to sell a bottle or two or at two, sixty-five, yeah. and all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just a matter of what you guys feel comfortable with. Like, like you said, well, Tim can't write all these things down, mm -hmm. but you guys could come up with three or four little different things that, when somebody's inquiring about the wine list, you know, like what I do when someone says about the menu, I don't like tell them what I like. It's like you like red, you like red sauce or white sauce. You like fish, you like meat, you like this, you like this. And I drill down and give them a recommendation. So you can almost do the same thing with wine. So white, white, red, dry, yeah. sweet, and then you could zoom. Just drill right in and have a couple of recommendations for them. And obviously you're not going to recommend the cheapest ones. No. no. Okay. But by the same token, and then what Tim said, okay, we're down to these couple. Why don't I give you a taste and see which ones you like? Yeah, I mean, that's a great and way to do it. A lot of customers that are saying, Pick out my dinner because I got a lot of customers says pick out my dinner and the bottle of wine. And I pick That's the beautiful. And I, whatever I pick for them, <clears> I remember <throat> what bottle of wine I'm going to give them with the dinner. And all the time it works out perfect. We're probably, you know, you we're probably a lot of water. I get you, guys. We're probably only selling 50% of the amount of wine that we could sell. By dollars, by dollars, I would say less. Even. Because we don't have the expertise. Well, it's, yeah. So then that's, is it appropriate to say, I don't know the answer to that question. Let me go run and get Keith see who has a lot more wine experience. Give me one second. Is that appropriate to do? Yeah. I mean, if, okay. if they ask. Because like, like, I had to do that. If they ask questions. Nights, they want me to, all, you know, I'm like, yeah. Keith see, please make sure these people get the right yeah. experience. And we went yeah. and talked about a bottle of wine. And yeah. we ended up picking up the most expensive one. And I told them. What was it? You know, it was a perfect Thank bottle of wine to go with their dinner, and they loved it. And they bought the Santa Cruz. Of course, it is. I mean, and they ended up getting a glass for dessert on top of that. Of the, <clears throat> is it the Amer American 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 no, Amacone. No, Amacone. Amacone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, here's the thing too: is it's it's surprising how sales on one table translate to sales on another. Mm -hmm. If you walk into a restaurant and every table has a bottle of wine on it, you order a bottle of wine, mm -hmm. unless you really don't drink wine, you know? And it's like when you see a seafood tower go by you in a restaurant, even though it might be 135 bucks, mm -hmm. if it looks that good, you you gotta have a seafood tower, you know, right? I tell a food runner, this is for the bar, but go through the entire yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, your dessert. Jeez, Absolutely. Right? That's oh, exactly wine. right. If people are seeing bottles of wine, you know, why would I get a glass? I might yep. just get a bottle. Exactly yeah. right. So yeah. I always tell them, I say, very good. You know, Take you're gonna, notes, guys. I always tell them, I bought a walk around. You're gonna, you know, you're going to have more than one glass. So why don't you just get the bottle? They're like, you know what? And I go, and I can cork it up for you to take it home. They're like, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. And that'd be, you know, another sales pitch for you. Yeah. So you make the bigger the sale, the bigger the tip. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Wine bags, by the way. And the other thing is, is the way the wine, the way the wine list is priced, it's, it's as if you get a free glass if you order a bottle. So, okay. does everybody understand that if you do yeah. the math, yeah. 
So if you look at a glass, if you look, it's like seven dollars a glass times four is twenty-eight. That's right. the bottle price. But the way that we should be pouring, you, it's you five know, glasses per bottle. You yeah. get five glasses in a bottle versus four. So if you do the math, five times seven is thirty-five less twenty-eight. So they do get a free glass. Yeah. Are you maybe going to show us how to pour today? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. I would, you know? I would like to see it. Yeah. I think, do you still have those five ounce carafes that you can use as a, a, a measuring? Pour or, or uh, open. present and open. Both. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure so, I'm gonna do, I'm for sure, I'll do, okay. I, I'm, well, I'm pour, here, whatever you need. Is, we're supposed to have glass at the bar that is five ounce pours. Yeah. Because when you start getting busy in free pour, we might as well not even sell wine because if everybody serves six ounces, we lose we'll money. Yeah, we'll be out of business. So, so I'm not really concerned about that because the bartenders are supposed to control that. For right. your guys' purposes, I'm more concerned about how you present the wine to a customer. But like if we have a party, like when we had the party Saturday, yeah. like well, you were even saying, you're like, it's not a science. I'm like, but I want it to be yeah. right. But at a party, you always, <laughs> want, like, just go on you always want to pour less because right. nobody's watching. Okay. Mm -hmm. One person is paying the bill. Right. So right. We're supposed to five ounces in the bar it should be five at a party it should be should like be four, four and a half okay if you will yeah. nobody should, i mean not that we want to rip off a customer right no. but if you're going to err on the correct side you want to pour it a little smaller okay. than bigger so casey can probably just show me that yeah, yeah. Okay. but to your point everyone needs to to review the wine service yeah, and we're going to do that. With the yeah. wine service, though, sure. wouldn't I be refilling? Yes. Repouring? Okay. Yes. I'm talking Are about a bottle. Yeah. How to take yeah. a bottle from the bar right. to the table. So yeah, then when it's at the table it. and right. it's it's empty, would I go and refill with their bottle? Does that question yes. make sense? Yes. 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 So, yes. so, therefore, I would like to see what five yes. ounces in a wine is. So they own the bottle now. Yeah, they don't. You know what you're doing. Yeah. I would just pour like maybe three ounces or something. Yeah. But you don't want to pour a guy, pour a woman, another five ounces. No. You might not want to drink it all. Okay. Normally, those stop. Like, okay. Okay. Yeah. I like to pour. Exactly. When they buy a bottle, I like to pour for them because that is presentation. Right. And no, yeah. So, so they're buying it and they're pouring it. I, that bothers me. I'd rather go do it because I'm doing my service. Yeah, I'm, I'm more right. worried about if a guy wears a sixty dollar bottle of wine in here or anywhere. Yeah. He's probably a wine guy. So if you miss serve oh, exactly. the bottle to him, right? Like Tim said, oh my God, these guys are serving sixty dollars bottles of wine, and they have people that don't even know not to touch the cork. I can't serve a bottle of wine. And that's Honestly, like, should I be able to? Probably, but I don't. But you guys all, there's a there's a science to this, and I think I told all of you this story once. A customer came in here, bought an expensive bottle of wine. It was five people. And we had a really good server that was a ball of walls girl. I can't remember her yeah. name. And she was awesome. Everybody loved yeah. her. But she wasn't, a, like I would say, a professional server. She was a part-time server. So she brings the bottle of wine. And I think even maybe Kixie or Carly opened it, taste, blah, 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 that whole process, right? So then the people liked it. Hour and through, she came over, oh, get you another bottle of wine? Sure. Got another bottle of wine, she brings it over, opens it, pours it in the guy's glass, and then he whoops says, Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm watching this. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, what did she do wrong? Yeah. It's a different bottle uh, of wine. Yes. He wanted to taste sure. the second bottle, even though it was identical, that uh, wine could be bad. Right. The wine could be bad. Right. The wine could be bad. So, 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 got the wrong temperature. Exactly yeah, right. So I said, Jesus Christ, you know. Same bottle from the same uh -huh. or something, but they all could be different. So that's where I always come to. You know, it's nice getting that thirty, forty, fifty dollars sale, but it makes us look foolish mm -hmm. if you don't know how to present it properly. So she should have just put a little just so like it was the first bottle. Backed up, let him yeah. do it. So you're going to go over there? Yeah, okay, yeah. So he's going to go over how yeah. in that uh, particular. Yes, please. Can I say a question? Yeah, sure. And also, we had my. When I went to school and took classes for wine and everything, we have the decanters. You sell a good bottle of wine, it should go into a decanter. Okay. Now, and I think you had one of those out on the floor. You always put them in a white wine hall. Yeah, so they should be no, not, that, not, not, not the silver wine. wine. 
The red one, we have a decanter that we pour the wine yeah. into the decanter. You're it's got like a big it. glass thing, yeah. Bob, that's always in like a yeah. weird shape. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So now I the, know what it looks like. I know what you're talking about. That's great. No, I, that guy, that guy, for instance, the worst case scenario could have been in that particular case. So imagine you just started pouring around the table, even though people had varying amounts of wine in their glass. And then you found out the wine was bad. Not only would you have to replace that bottle, you'd, you'd honestly have to buy him another bottle because there was already wine in all the glasses to begin with. Right. So that's, well, I mean, he actually did you as a restaurant a service, but you want to bring out a separate glass too. Um, and and you, it, basically you're starting from zero. And then if you really want to be formal, you want to say, sir, would you like me to bring fresh glasses for this bottle? 90, uh, sir, sir or ma'am, whatever. 90% um, of the times they'll say, oh, no, no, that's not necessary. Or bring one for their first I always, Right. I, 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 well, I didn't even know that either. Yeah, uh, and, and there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Second bottle, new ones. Yes. Mm -hmm. at, at least, least for the taste. At least for the taste. And then, and then offer new ones. And here's the thing, for me, I will never take it. I will never, I generally won't take a second glass, and you know why? Almost always, if you go, and, and this is from the, the, the chain restaurant to the finest dining restaurant, almost always there's going to be a slight bit of odor in a glass. It's usually from the rinse agent or from the detergent that was used for the polishing cloth to wash the polishing cloth. And I know that sounds crazy. No, I heard about that. But you absolutely, like if you go downstairs and you will smell the glasses, you know, like you've seen me season the glasses. And again, to 99.9% .9 of the people, they're never going to notice it. But the, the point is, is once you've had the glass seasoned with the wine, you know, if it's the same wine, I'm not saying for, the, for different wines, of course, but for the same wine, I'd rather have the glass that I've already used mm -hmm. because I know it tastes like wine, right? And I know it smells like wine at that point. Well, you have the people that they want to Absolutely. And there's, and again, I, I think it's always nice to offer and there's nothing wrong with just doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, proper, proper service, you should put a new glass down. But the point is, is, is generally speaking it, you know, rest, it, the tables get cluttered. It's more dishes to do. And then one other thing I'll make a note of too, everybody knows that you should just grab the glass by the stem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and why do you think that is? A so lot of reasons. Making the glass dirty. That's so you're that's not the big one. Contaminating it. That's the biggest one. And yeah. believe me, have you ever seen people literally grab? Oh, yeah, oh my know. god. That's Tom's biggest. I was gonna say I remember that. Yeah. Was your biggest pet peeve. Yeah. yeah, and it's crazy. But but here's the other thing that nobody thinks about. So you got that beautiful hand soap that's rosemary and this and that scented and cilantro or whatever is in it, you know, and then you're playing around with the glass. You're not anywhere near the lip, but the person comes up to their mouth and what do they smell? They smell the rosemary and cilantro from the wash soap, not the wine. That sounds crazy, but yeah. And the other thing too on that subject, if you want to be perfectly technical, is is if you're using for your own personal uh, hygiene routine, if you're using anything that has like an extremely strong scent, whether it's, you know, soap or whatever, perfume, whatever. Um, it's kind of a no-no um, uh, from a standpoint of, you know, it can overpower. Certain people have a real, have you ever smelled somebody walk in a room and you're like, oh my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly, you don't want that because you're, because then you're kind of fighting the food and you're fighting the wine. And the beautiful thing is that the nose has a, a a solution for that and it's called sensory adaptation so after a little while it, it gets rid of that smell because that smell is there and that's what makes wine such a beautiful thing with food is wine does the same thing to the palate it kind of resets the palate with the acidity and the flavor of the wine and then it makes the next bite of food taste like it's the first bite again you know so that's that's one of the beautiful things okay we got to keep moving along here uh, any okay, so any other aromatic white? Let me do one more here. What would an aromatic white be? There's, let's see how many we can pick before we go wrong. Tom, you go first. 
Aromatic white. Um, aromatic white. I'm going to just guess because I don't know the answer. Chardonnay, I know. No. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Riesling. Riesling, yep. What's aromatic mean? That means it's very, very a, a strong it. aroma. Oh. Yeah, Sauvignon Blanc is a classic example. You know how you can really smell the, okay. the grassiness. Okay. Now, Chardonnay is not a super aromatic grape, but with a lot of oak, sometimes it will smell a little bit. But there's a couple of other. Anyone else want to take a shot? The Gabi is very aromatic, yes. So it's, um, do you want it white or red? White. White, okay. Well, Aromatic white. I, Moscato. Yes, like that. Moscato, yeah. absolutely. Because That's exactly it right. It has all that fruit and all the, yes. the, you can smell the, the flowers and it's just, oh, you, it's just amazing the smell. smell right, the, right. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, so then we, we go to the next and here's sparkling. So these are kind of like a good, we don't need to go through all these because only a few apply in this particular case. But these are kind of different categories and examples that fall within them. So Cava is obviously sparkling wine from Spain. But the one that you really need to worry about here is of course the Prosecco. So that's your sparkler there. And I think that's also something that you could make it with a couple of drinks too, correct? You can make a martini, you can make a mimosa. You could, I don't know if you can make a Bellini if you have peach nectar, I don't know if you have, okay. So those are some classic Prosecco-based cocktails um, uh, if you want something that's a little bit different. and I a, uh, a drink with uh, beer with Prosecco. Wow. Yeah. That sounds interesting. It came out pretty good. <laughs> I bet it did. I bet it did. Okay, so these are different categories. And then you see Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, lighter bodied. Now, these are general rules of thumb. So there's always going to be kind of some exceptions to the rule, but these are good general rules of thumb. So this chart is somebody asked for a full body, body white wine. Right. And we would know, okay, these are the ones we're, we're gonna recommend. Yes, yes. We're gonna get that? Yeah, and Chardonnay would, Chardonnay would be the, the go-to on that. Um, but if they didn't mind fruity, I mean, the Rieslings are, are pretty, that Riesling is very rich and full flavored as well, so. The Riesling we uh, have, I think is number one. It's good. It's amazing. It's very good. Love yeah, yeah. And um, it's it's definitely worth mentioning that you know you're going to have a few people who won't recognize a lot of these names because these are really mostly really small specialty, very passionate wineries. And don't look at that as a negative. Look at that as like you know yeah that's exactly right. It's it's unique, it's something that we wanna to offer to you that you can't get everywhere. I mean, you know, a lot of the menu of Italian restaurants is made differently at each one, but if you look at most of the menus from Italian restaurants, probably 60 to 70% of it is the same everywhere. Oh, you know? you know the bottle was that somebody wanted and you were laughing because you could get it off the street? Well, I was gonna say earlier, the thing, restaurants don't, good restaurants don't carry wines that you can get at the grocery store. Because no. you don't want people coming in here and saying, do you have Kendall Jackson? Well, no, we don't have Kendall Jackson. You can no. go to the grocery yeah, store yeah. get Kendall Jackson. So the only one I think is somewhere, is the one he doesn't even carry. It's the only one wine that we don't get from him. It's the Amicone, mm -hmm. which I think that's you can get at the beverage store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but people but come that's, in and they love it. Yeah, and, yeah. and our, 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 the reason we put this wine list together is so you can't get these wines at grocery store or at a beverage store because we, we couldn't get away selling them for $30 if you could buy them across the street for 15 so Well, if they sold a Moscato that's 10 bucks at Target and they sold it for like 28 bucks. Yeah. They would sell it non Moscato yeah. that's a $10 Target one. Yeah, like our, yeah. our phone, $9.99. Right. Our phone sells off the shelf. Yeah. And me and Tom are laughing because Tom goes, yeah, you can get it off the street. And we were laughing. I don't know what I saw. Yeah. Sells, yeah, and it sounds like crazy here. Yeah. People love it. Well, I'll tell you, it's the fruitiness of it. It's, it's a red that has a lot of sweetness to it. And it's almost like a Rapasso, but it's not from the, the right part of the Veneto to be called the Rapasso. Yeah, and Americans... 
in general like things sweet. You know, we almost all of us grow up uh, drinking Coke or Pepsi or something like that. So we tend to, even when we say we like dry wines, we tend to. <laughs> yeah, that, you don't give me a box of Amacone and I think we'll be sold out in three or four days. Wow, that's okay. Well, there you go. Well, that's good. Um, okay, so then we go to the next page. You've got some of the medium bodied reds there. Um, you know, off your, does everybody know that Sangiovese is the main grape for Chianti? Yeah, so the third third wine down there, S-A-N-G-I-O-V-E-S-E, -E, that's the main grape for Chianti. It's also 50% of the Fasalaya that we talked about earlier. And um, yeah, that's kind of a, that's Italy's most widely planted red grape. And it's Tuscany's most famous grape. Yeah, it's really, so it's light to medium bodied. Um, well, we're gonna get to a little bit more taste profile farther down. But if there's some of these that are on your list that you have a question as we're going through, I mean, it's not that I wouldn't go through every single one of them, but we would be here all day, so I don't wanna do that necessarily. But like Valpolicella blends, you know, that's kind of a, that's gonna be probably the grapes that are in the Amicone. Probably Corvin Corvinia, Rondinella, uh, Corvinisi. Um, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that's what's, what's in it. So, so if there's any grapes um, that you see as we're going through that you have a question, full-bodied Cabernet Sauvignon is you know probably gonna be far and away one of your best-selling red wines. In spite of being an Italian restaurant, that's just like, the best-selling red grape. So, you know? so back to that, just so practical, and this happens all the time, is somebody says, oh, I like Cabernet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I'd ask you guys, well, what's the difference between the Dante, the William Cabernet, and the Michael Pazan or the Annabelle? Right. So I'm, I'm, I like Cabernets. I come in here, and I go down here, and those are the four Cabernets. I mean, other than, I always say, Cabernet is a little better, only because the price. Yeah. I can't answer that question. And I would say our number one sales probably are Cabernet. Yeah. Yes. We sell more of the Dante Cab mm -hmm. than yeah. anything else. Yeah. But I've had people just because they think the Cabernet is better because of the price point. Yeah. So, so from a from a sales standpoint, yeah. how do we answer the question, even if we just want to keep it? Sure. Does everybody see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. How do we just, how do we answer that simple question? Well, I would say that the Dante is excellent. They source from all over California. It's our easy drinking Cabernet Sauvignon. If you want something a little bigger structure, a little more depth, a little more concentration, you want the William Cabernet. Okay. I mean, that's the easiest way to say it. A little it. more depth, a little more structure. Absolutely, and considerably more. more. Like and the, yeah, the Dante is a great little, I mean, it's a great little cab. But if you try them side by side, you'll be shocked yeah. at how oh, different yeah. they are. Yeah. There's a big, big difference. Yeah. Is that why they're on different spots on the menu? Yeah, and that's why you see it's below the other one. So that means it's fuller, more fuller body, bigger, richer, right. But also um, the fact that it comes from Sonoma. Sonoma's, Sonoma and Napa are probably the two premier growing areas in California for Cabernet Sauvignon. So, Napa? That makes good wine. yeah. Okay. And if you go, if you go over to the bottle side, you'll see Napa and you'll see Alexander Valley. And those are also, in fact, Napa, that's say The Sailor's Grave is just, it's a, it's, a, I mean, it's a world-class, I mean, what I would, how I would sell that, I would sell if you like, if you like a really big, rich Napa cab, I'm gonna sell you one that you think you should be paying $150 a bottle oh, yeah. for. I mean, that's what it tastes like, exactly. you know? Yeah, the Sailor's Grave, yeah. Those are the wines that, honestly, I only give three bottles in here at a time because as a team, hmm. we don't really know how to sell those wines. Yeah. So we'll order take those. Yeah. So if somebody wants a more expensive cab, they'll go on the right bottom. Yeah. And they'll mm -hmm. say, I'll take Sailor's Grave. Yeah. But we sell Dante and William Cavney. Week in, week out. 30 yeah. to 1. Yeah. Only because we don't know the wines. 
because that yeah. th those yeah. those bottles of cab are awesome. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, yeah, you, but we yeah. just you can't convince a customer. Well, I'm looking at it. And not that I like to blow money, but if I'm seeing a thirty or thirty-five dollar bottle of wine versus a forty or fifty, you got to sell me what the difference is. And that's how I know. And that's yeah. that's the problem is we don't have enough bullets in our gun. Well, here's the th yeah, and this is perfect. That, that's exactly what I'm saying, though. The thing is, is you're not comparing those to what you have over here. You're comparing that wine to a hundred and fifty dollar wine at a great white, yeah, at a great white white tablecloth restaurant, because that's what it's going to cost for that quality of wine. And and I'll just give you a reference point. And and, and our idea too, and this is something that anybody who's really savvy about wine would pick up on right away is the higher end the wine the lower the markup so it's it's not that you're you're not gouging them anywhere believe me and i work with plenty of restaurants who do you're not you're not you're very but the point is is when you get to the higher end you know he's pricing them to sell they're i mean you know if you go to if you go to a, a lot of the white tablecloth restaurants around town, Sailor Grave is going to be more like seventy five to ninety dollars. Yeah, yeah. And it drinks like a hundred fifty dollar bottle. But he's also friends with the winemaker because I mean we stayed at the winemaker's house when we went out and visited, um, and it's not that we're. I, I mean, again, I'm not saying fifty five dollars is a is a. All I'm saying is. $55 for that wine yeah. is a steal. steal. Because when yeah. the customer were talking about, he said the Sailor's Grave was $75 in downtown. Yeah. And I said, I know, you're getting it cheap, you know, half price here. Yeah. And he I mean, bought it, he's like, every time he comes in, he has a bottle. That's it. Yeah, why? And I noticed this when I first started working here because I'm like brand new. What? The, so we do have a seventy-five dollar bottle of wine, the Amarone. Why is that so expensive? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. Okay. So when they make Amarone, what they do? It's from the Veneto part of Italy, so it's real close to Venice in the northeastern part of Italy. They harvest the grapes, and then they take the grapes and they put them above the winery, usually in the attic. That's the old way. Now they use very humidity controlled and everything and, and wind going through. They lay them out on straw mats or in plastic bins. They dry the grapes until they're like raisins before they press them and make wine. Have you ever squeezed a raisin? Mm -hmm. Not a lot of juice comes out of a raisin, does it? No, but it's extremely concentrated and rich. So to make one bottle of that might take 20 bunches of grape Whereas to make one bottle of table wine might take three bunches. So it's the process. The process. The process. Absolutely. They say all that in one sentence, which would just be the, the, the process is... Yeah, the, the, the way they make Amarone, they, they dry the grapes to raisins. Can you imagine squeezing raisins? You get the most delicious, rich fruit, but you don't get a lot of it per grape. Therefore, the price. You know, I mean, it makes perfect sense you know, if you think about it because but the flavor i mean it's just like layer after layer after wave of and it's higher alcohol which is not a and i'm not saying higher alcohol is always good but with wine with that density and richness and layers it can stand that alcohol now i tend to think of it a little bit more of a, a cold weather wine because it's so naturally warming and rich but i have friends who drink it year round all the time you know so yeah, that's why that costs a little bit more. But again, when you see that $75, you say, you know what? That particular category is expensive because of the way they make it. Say, but what? compare this against a $125 Amarone in most restaurants. I mean, really. So the, the, the good news is, is we do sell some. Yeah, I'm yeah. not saying that the wines on the right we never sell. No, uh, but I would say we probably of those 15 bottles of wine that are by the bottle only, we probably sell maybe eight to ten a week. Whereas if we knew a little more, you could easily there, sell thirty or probably forty. Sell yeah. two or three times as much. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. 
the, the good expensive one. He wants you to have the knowledge so you can go to a table and yes. say, you know what, you want this, but you know, there's this that we have. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to get you to do, learn. And the other thing you can do too is you can say, hey, listen, I met the guy who put the, the wine list together. He's got 30 years in the wine business and in the restaurant business. And you could just tell he loves it. And I'm not afraid to recommend anything on this list. You know, and then when, when we say pride of Italy, pride of Italy. I mean, these are some of the most famous wines from Italy. Barolo, Barbaresco, yeah. Brunello di Montalcino, Amarone. I mean, those are like the gem. And don't get me wrong, I love Napa Cabernets. Don't, don't get me wrong. But with your food here, I mean, I'm, drink, I'm drinking Brunello or Barbaresco, you know, I mean, because that's what I would love to drink here. With, or, you know what, the Chianti Classico Reserva, Il Grigio is a great. And this Montepulciano de Bruzzo oh. is a blockbuster for El Money. I mean, it's like over delivers. So what you can use is a technique that's called, uh, again, we're gonna, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop on that because we're about to get into that part of the conversation. And a lot of this is gonna roll right over. Does anyone have any other questions about grape varieties as we go through this particular category? No, I'm excited about the next part. Okay. All right, so then uh, what I did here was I- We're out of time. We have uh, another 30, 25 to 30 minutes. Okay, okay, so we're doing okay. Um, so here's a, here's a little bit more detail on the main grapes that are on your wine list in this category. And some general flavor profiles what I always say about those, again, going back to that, a taste is worth a thousand words. You know, don't get too caught up in, you know, saying, oh, it's got a black cherry, this, that, everything. Because again, a lot of that, these are general things, but a lot of that is really more about how you personally interpret the wine, okay? So pronunciations, is everybody familiar saying Cabernet Sauvignon? Yeah, but this has got them phonetically spelled too. So if you're a little bit unsure, you can kind of look at that real easily. Uh, Merlot, did anyone ever call it Merlot in there? I yeah. have a guest that do it. Yeah. <laughs> I go up to the bar and I'm like, I need a Merlot. Yeah, no, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I That's can't great. hear and I can like, like what's yeah. Merlot? <laughs> That's all right, you know, hey, it's great. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Now here's a strange little tidbit while we're going through here. So guess what Cabernet Sauvignon, how did Cabernet Sauvignon evolve? What's the question? How did Cabernet Sauvignon evolve? No idea. It's the child, it's the child of Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc, oh. which makes no sense, does no. it? How do you take a lighter bodied red which is Cabernet Franc, that has a little bit of a fresh rubbed herbaceousness that's very typical for that grape, and a white aromatic grape, combine the two and come up with Cabernet Sauvignon. It doesn't really make any sense, but those are the parent grapes, hence the name, Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah, it's kind of a bizarre thing. Now that's how it started. Over the years, it's been bred to make it bigger and bigger. And what's nice about Cabernet Sauvignon is it's a grape that grows almost every major wine region around the world. A few exceptions, like Ohio is not a good place. I'm not saying it's a major wine, but it's not generally a good place for Cabernet Sauvignon because it's a late ripening grape. And occasionally we get bad winters here, if you've never noticed, you know. So we don't have the hang time to get Cabernet Sauvignon consistently ripe. Yeah. Yeah, and there's yeah, there's some little pairing suggestions too and different things. Um, Chardonnay, we talked about a little bit, originally from the Burgundy area. Kind of one of the noble white wine grapes, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay are both noble varieties. And what, what that means is they're recognized as producing some of the most incredible wines around the world. Um, Merlot is also in that category, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, and Riesling, just for your information. Peanut. Gooseberry is a type of fruit that has a real pungent 
Have you ever had, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Do you ever eat Thai food? Yes. And you, you ever had the crushed lemongrass? Uh -huh. Think of that along with grapefruit zest and unripe pear. And that's what gooseberry t reminds me of. Again, that's my personal take. So, well, but it's a type of fruit. Okay, fruit yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. These little notes back here are pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So Cortese, and I put Gavi in, in parentheses because Cortese is the grape that they used to make Gavi. So you've got the Piccolo Ernesto. Piccolo, what does that mean? Does anyone know what Piccolo means in Italian? Piccolo. Yeah. Think a little. Yeah? No. Little. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, the flu. There you go. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, little Ernesto is, you know, basically the estate's name. And uh, so what I would suggest to you guys is, is don't be afraid. This wine is a delicious little wine that nobody, I don't want to say nobody, but most people don't know of. So that's one if like, hey, if you guys want to try a really cool little white wine from Italy, I'd love to bring you a little taste of this gabi. Oh, yeah. But what yeah. if the seashell means, um, why is seashell involved with the honeydew and the apple? That's kind of a, like, have you ever smelled the ground up oyster shells? Yes. Yeah, that's kind of a, like a, the mineral element that you sometimes find in the Cortese grape. That's like when you're tasting things blind, oftentimes crushed seashells. You're associated with something yeah. party. Or gravel. So not right, no, there's no seashells in it. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's, a, it's an aroma. Yeah. Have you, I don't know if you ever, when you were a kid and you were playing in a like creek or something, you ever pick up a stone and it somehow it ended up in your mouth. And you know, that has a, that's like a very distinct flavor that you find in certain wines, like yeah. a I river a rock. In the backyard. I had a river in the backyard yeah. in Puerto Rico on a mountain. So, there yeah. you go. Okay, so then we go down, we've got, uh, you know, so bone dry. You know, I don't think it's really bone dry, but it's definitely dry. Yeah. So, again, these are generalizations for the grapes. So take them with a, and then Malbec. Malbec's, of course, Argentina's famous red grape. Um, and the Finca Passione you do real well with. It's real easy drinking. It's medium to fuller bodied, nice dark fruit, uh, plum, you know, tobacco. Now, don't think... Don't think of smoking cigarettes or anything like that. Think of like if you've ever walked into a humidor where they store cigars. I don't know if you've ever been. It, it, that's when they, when they say tobacco, that's what they're really referring to. Yeah, it's, and often they're cedar lined and the, the combination of the cedar, that's like a classic with Malbec and it's a classic with certain areas of Cabernet Sauvignon, yeah. Okay, then Nebbiolo on the bottom. So Nebbiolo, um, just so you know, you'll see Barolo and Barolo and Barbaresco under the pride of Italy on the wine list. Nebbiolo is the grape that goes into those. So Bar Barolo and Barbaresco are places in Italy, wine zones, they're also cities but the grape is Nebbiolo, okay? And Nebbiolo is, is very, usually very, very dry. And it has, when it's young, it has really drying tannins. Is, is everyone familiar with tannins? Tannins, imagine you left uh, two tea bags in your teacup and you forgot about it. And then you went to drink it and it's kind of bitter. It makes your mouth almost dry. Those are tannins, yeah. And they come from two things. They come from the barrel and they come from the skin of the grapes. So the more tannins drier, the yeah. less. Yes, nah. exactly right, exactly right, okay. Um, Riesling, I know I, I can't get a better endorsement than you gave earlier for the Riesling, but uh, Riesling is kind of like uh, the, the wine Psalm's favorite white right now. And, and the Riesling you're doing is uh, um, uh, Bill Blumen. Everyone's gonna call it Wild Blumen, but if you care, it's it's German, so it's build blumen, and it translates to wildflowers. And it, if you want a little story about that, 
Often in great vineyards, they plant wildflowers around the perimeter of the vineyard because the flowers, as soon as they see the flowers are becoming unhealthy, they know something is coming into the vineyard. The, the flowers are like an early detection system for pests or, or problems in the vineyard. So when you see the flowers at the end of the vine rows, they're there to kind of warn the farmer that, uh-oh, something's going wrong here. Hmm. Yeah, just FYI. Uh, Pinot Grigio is the same as Pinot Gris, if you've ever seen Pinot Gris, spelled G-R-I-S. Grigio, does anyone know what that means? If you translate it from Italian to English? Gray. And it's a white grape, but when it gets fully ripe, it has like a grayish hue. Almost grayish, slightly copperish hue. But it's almost always vinified without the skin. So you don't get the color in the, and does everybody realize that when you crush red grapes, the juice is white? Oh, All the, uh -huh. yeah, the color is really, with few exceptions, the color is in the skin. So if you don't leave it soaking on the skins, you'll get, you can make white wine from red grapes. Yeah, so. Okay, Sangiovese, uh, you know, hey, this is, uh, this is the, 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 the grape, that really they've tried to grow it everywhere in the world and nowhere does it grow like it does in Italy and most specifically in Tuscany. So it's one of those grapes that it's again, an icon grape along with Nebbiolo and Barbera and a few others from Italy that really don't grow anywhere else in the world successfully. So that's kind of a fun thing to promote, especially with Italian foods. You know what they say, if it, if it grows here, it goes here, you know? So, um, some food pairing and stuff like that. Any other questions on any of the, the grapes that are on the list, etc.? Not at the moment. Not at the moment, okay. So, so now we're gonna kind of talk a little bit about, uh, anybody take any psychology classes at university? Okay. Yeah, there you go. So, so there's a writer, his name is uh, Robert Cialdini, and he's of course Italian, because why wouldn't he be, right? Or in an Italian restaurant. And he write, uh, write, wrote a, a book, uh, I don't remember the title of the book, but there's a very popular bill, uh, video called The Science of Persuasion. And it talks about just general uh, selling techniques and why people buy. And to me, it's a great way to kind of take these elements that apply to sales everywhere, but try to figure out how we can apply them in a restaurant, okay? And he said, it all comes down to these six categories. And the first one is reciprocity, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And basically it's like when you do something for someone, they feel somewhat obligated to do something for you. You know, kind of like, if you invite someone to a party, maybe down the line, they'll invite you to their party. You know, if you take someone to dinner, that's like, like he and I, you know, normally when I take out a client, I usually buy, but he always insists on, you know, like we kind of take turns, you know, it's kind of like, okay, is it your turn or is it my turn? You know, so that's kind of like reciprocity. So when you bring, you know, something as simple as when you bring someone a little taste of wine, you've kind of done something a little bit above and beyond. And, and again, I don't, don't misunderstand me. These are not meant to manipulate or anything like that. What these are is these are tools to uh, give you the opportunity to maximize what the guest gets out of it. Never do anything with a force or a devious nature because what I will say there, that always backfires in the end, you know? So all this is just take it as it was. But like one of the things that intrigued me when I read this book was they were talking about mints. One of the actual things was a study in England they did, and they talked about how tips changed if you presented a mint with the check. You know, I don't know if you guys do that. Do you do that? Yeah, let's go yeah. mints. <laughs> you know what? Um, do, we, do we have any mints? That's an olive check. Yeah, that is. Oh, no, no, just hear me out. Well, it is. Yeah. Those tips that they have in the Yeah. yeah. So we give you, we brought you a bag of mints so you can test this yourself. Yeah. We can so basically, yeah. Yeah. 
So basically what they said, what the study said, if you, if you give one mint with the tip, or excuse me, one mint with the check, um, your tips would increase by 3%, all else being you know, held over. And again, this was an extensive study at a, a restaurant. Two mints, the tips increased by 14%. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, it's, it's kind of uncanny, you know, but it's, uh, and then they said, if, it, if you came back and gave them an extra mint, and again, I'm not telling you to do this. I brought this as fun, but I was, I, for me, I would love to, you know, I mean, we always gave oh, these little, yeah, 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 I think so. I think so, because um, again, it's, you know, what does that cost? I mean, it's $9 for a bag of how many hundred? I don't know. But the point is, is it's just a little something extra, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So in the mind, it creates a smile, if you will. Now, it's not going to be nearly as impactful as the rest of their experience, mm -hmm. but it's a nice way to end the meal. You know? And then I don't know if another thing, if you, if you write thank you yes. mm -hmm. on the note, uh, hope to see you soon. Mm -hmm. Anything like that, hope, hope you come back soon, something like that on the check. Not only do they come back sooner, they tip you more. Mm -hmm. And again, is that mani manipulative? I don't know, I don't think it is. It's I think, it, nice. yeah, I think, I think in the end of the day, everybody craves the appreciation of like, isn't there, there's nothing better when you walk in and yeah. someone says, hey, how you been? I'm so glad you came in, you know, right, right. I mean, it's like, so I think in our heart, we always crave that appreciation that we've come somewhere or we've done something. And uh, so therefore you've, you've made them, you've given them an opportunity. And the thing is, if it didn't matter to them, then it would not affect the tips at all, right? So reciprocity, what I'd like to do though, is think about, we talked earlier about the little taste of wine when they're not sure what they want. What's another way that we could do something that would create reciprocity in the restaurant? And it doesn't necessarily have to be something that we give them, but it could be. Well, one thing that I always think is when everyone says, all, everybody that walks by a customer, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. When they leave, well, thanks for coming, even if it's not your customer. Right. That's giving to me a special thank you out of his right. niceness, as Rick said. You know, yeah. Like you, owning a restaurant, when I walk in the restaurants, I'm so critical. I walk in a place, Jesus Christ, I walk by the hostess, she didn't even say thank you. Good to right. see you. Yeah. Right. Or you come in, oh, hi, good to see you. Well, this is the first time I've been here, but it's good to see you. Anyway. Oh, yeah, right. You know, something, even like, to me, if you don't get thanked, by everyone that walks by you on the way out, it's like, come on, guys. Yeah. You know, it's like you're not thanking me. Right. You know, have, have a nice day. Thanks. Or, right. It's, just, it's something. So I think that to me, versus giving me something for free, because yeah. I don't like anything for free. I rather pay for everything. Yeah. To your point. Just being nice and thanking me for coming will bring me the, because you, you guys all go to places you feel comfortable at, or you're appreciative of the people that are there. I mean. I like, the, okay, where am I gonna go? Uh, I like the bartenders there, or I like the people there, or the owner's always there, or the hostess is always greets me nice, or the service is yeah. nice. Yeah, okay, the food is great, the service is good, but there's always something to me, like you're saying. Yeah, and, and a lot of times you can't even, you can't even put your, sometimes you can't even put your finger on it, why you wanna go there, you know? But you just wanna go to certain places. And, and yeah, it's probably a lot of everything. But I know for sure that you have a lot of places to find food, to get food, to have food delivered, to, you know, I mean, everything. So the point is, is when somebody comes and gets out and does something and, and comes to your place. And again, I always like to think of it as, don't think of this as Tom's business. Think of it as your business within Tom's business. Because, I mean, again, it's, I always treat it like you're your own little franchise. And you want to make sure that other, the other franchises are good, doing well too. And you want to make sure that people enjoy it. And if somebody's busy tonight, maybe tomorrow night when you're jammed, they'll help you. I mean, it's kind of, it's just, you know, all helps. But in the reciprocity, can anyone think of anything else that would fall into that particular category? 
boxing or food for them? I, I think if that's, again, the only deferment I would have there is if that's something, you know, I know some people now, I think what I would do, and again, you say no. You're, you're, I it, offer. I, I always offer. offer. May I box this for you? Yeah. I don't want you to tell you. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't have to pay the time to box it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll use that spiel. Would you like me to box it or would you like me to just give you the box? Yeah. And I'm thinking, I hope they just take the box. So now I gotta take the time, I gotta go in the back, yeah. I gotta do this, I gotta <laughs> But that's exactly right. So and, and the people who are I think it's great to ask. These people come in, especially in the bar, they love to be spoiled. Of course. Yeah. So Everybody like, loves to be spoiled. I'm on I mean, my way to spoil them because they'll come back. Of course. And that's it. If you can look at it and just say, you know, these people are choosing to come here. I want to make it special for them. Even, mind you, even if you're having the roughest day of your life, yes. you got to just leave it at the door and you got to come in. You got to put the happy face on. And you know what's amazing is when you force yourself to smile and be friendly, you feel better already immediately. You really do. This is like my happy yeah. place. When I come into the, yeah. to my job, to the bar, it's like my happy place. It's like my home. What about this? What about if you gave them a little insider tip and you said to them, you said, hey, I just want to mention, we've got a live act in next Wednesday. If you haven't booked a table, make sure you get one booked tonight because this band or this singer or this guitarist is fantastic. Something like that is a nice tip. If they're interested, they'll sign up. But it's also a great reason for them to come back. I like that with uh, Frank and Dean. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then on top of it, who knows? Maybe they'll ask for you too because, you know, you kind of are, you know, you're. You you're gave the, them the heads up. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, to my brothers, I sent them the uh, text message with the specials for the week. <laughs> Hey, that's fantastic. And I that's fantastic. The, you know what Tom got going on for the week? Yeah. And I gave him mostly like okay. 20 text messages telling me that they're going to come in if they come on table. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep moving here. Now, scarcity is another one of the six things. So, like, let's say you have a special tonight and you tell the special, like, give me one of the specials. Um, sure. Uh, sure. Okay. Walleye, the, the sauteed wild, wild. Uh, Walleye with? Risotto, red, yeah. to, um, red tomatoes, black olives, uh, um, served. Right, okay. Then you finish it with what? You, uh, we have a glass of red wine that goes perfect with it. Or okay. Or we can make a white wine that would go yep. even better. Not yet, not no, yet, not yet. Not yet. There's only five left. So There's yeah. five or we have five orders. Let me know right away if you're interested in that. Okay, scarcity. It sounds crazy, but it's it's absolutely true. And and then, you know, and, and then the thing is is if you if you do get locked out, you know, cuz who's done well, the, who's having those again? Let me know when you're having those again. Right. Right. I'll be back next week on Saturday. Yes. I'll yes. be here. Let me know. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, the thing is is Oh, this is their special tonight. It'll be whatever. The menu is always there. Right. Yeah. Well, that's it. You know. Okay. So authority. Now, this is mind-boggling here. So people will follow credible, knowledgeable experts. And I don't know if you remember me mentioning earlier. And again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but if you say, "Oh, our wine list was put together by a local importer and distributor," he's got. 20 some years in the hospitality business. They're all small, almost all small family owned wineries. So we're really excited for you to, you know, suggest or you to so enjoy we, one of them. When, Select do go, them. when do we get to go to wineries? So yeah, whatever you like. So we can say, well, we've been there. Whatever you like. You got to fly over, but once you're over, you're that? taking care of Italy. Oh well, God. not just That's Italy, cool. but. No, I mean, hey. All right, Tom, group trip. Yeah. Let's call. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's, here's the best. Here's the best part. Yeah, no, no, we got California too. Here's the best part is you, you guys, if you go in there and they use the example, um, in-house recommendation led to twenty percent increase. Okay, so imagine that the host or hostess seats the table and they say, um, 
I'm sorry, what was your name? Alexa. Alexa. Alexis. And they say, oh, please enjoy your meal tonight. Alexis is taking care of you. She's one of our best new servers. They've set the table, even though they've, you know, you're the same company, you're the same organization. So of course they would want to say something good about you, but it still had the same kind of effect on the table that it already created a positive image in the table's mind. Just because the host or hostess said, oh, you know, Bobby's taking care of you tonight. Bobby's fantastic. You know, don't get them started about baseball though, you know, or just something fun, you know? Okay, consistency. This is probably the hardest thing, if you think about it, to do it in and out, busy, rain, snow, whatever, every time, every day, every plate, every hour, and do it well and keep it the same and keeping it upbeat and keeping it great. But consistency is so important. And again, that's like a power, superpower when it comes to that. Liking, you know, if you're not friendly and you're not gonna, I mean, think about it. How many of you have gone out and had a server and you're just like, oh my God, this person, I feel like letting them sit down and me taking over because they look like they're miserable. You know, the thing is, is hey, that's your job. You gotta, you know, even if you gotta, no, I mean, do, we all see them. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, is liking. Well, why do we like people? We like people that uh, are like us. We like people who pay us compliments and we like people who cooperate with us. That sounds simple, but those are just like three, re there's many reasons, but those are three main reasons that we like people. It sets the tone for yeah. the whole place. Right, you know? right. So imagine, what do you think? What do you think you know about every single customer who comes in here? They're hungry. They're hungry and they probably like Italian food, right? Mm -hmm. So right there, I hope you love Italian food as much as I do, because you're in the right spot. I mean, they probably like Italian food. They're here for Italian food, right? No, I mean. I always say, like, you gotta come up with spiel. Yeah. Instead of say, hi, my name's Tom, I'm gonna be yeah. taking care of it tonight. Don't you think Everybody it's, says that. Don't you think it, you gotta be careful of corniness though? You know what, I think. People I, love corny. I think if it's authentic. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. I think if it's authentic. Yeah, like, I guess so, <laughs> get corny. I'm so corny sometimes. I it's think- I'll walk away laughing at myself. Yeah, I <laughs> oh, think- Oh, I hope that works, cause wow. <laughs> cause wow. That's why I love you. <laughs> there you go, I mean that's- I'm glad I brought that one. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, hey, you oh, know- You did an amazing job yesterday. <laughs> oh gosh. I mean, I try to say when people greet on me, oh, hi, are you hungry? Yeah. Well, you came to the right, something like that. Like, yeah. I walk in, instead of coming up, feeling hungry, they ate up to the other. Are you hungry? Well, I asked what you said. You said, hey, do you love Italian food? And they're like, yeah. Well, yeah. We're in the right place. Sure. Yeah. 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 Here's the other. Here's the other thing. I hope someone would be like, actually, I hate Italian food. Oh, well. We're going to change your mind. Yeah. <laughs> right? Not today. Tony Rocco's going to change your mind. Well, here's the thing, too, is think about it. If you have, who who knows any, does anyone here know? Oh, my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, my God. Straight chilling. The paw and everything is perfect. Who, who knows who knows In-N-Out Burger? You guys know In-N-Out Burger? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Who knows a secret menu item? I never, we don't have them here. They, no, and they do have a secret menu item. My kids ordered a secret menu item when we were in yeah. California, and I can't think of what they ordered. Four by four monster style, let's yeah. say. Animal style, excuse me, animal yeah. style. Animal style, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's an example. Right in there, and I have no clue what they're eating. Yeah. We had it the first time, it was the, I don't know how much meatballs you gave for something, oh, something. Yeah. Remember yeah. that? The meatball, <laughs> it was a, uh, all the meatballs and stuff. Yeah, five, yeah. Five, yeah. Five, yeah. Five, yeah. Five, well, no, but that, challenge. yeah, but that was, that was a fun, I mean, that was like a fun, like, yeah. oh, yeah, I see who can do it, you know, yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. but, but, but this is like something that's not on the menu. That's yeah, like, like a, a personal concert. favorite or something you guys like. So if you had a regular, you could say, Hey, just so you know, if you order this, here's what you're going to get. 
You know, it's funny that you say that because the other night I have like a few bottles of wine. I just call them special bottles. Yeah. Like when I was like Ghost Block. Oh or man. Like the Secret Sellers. Yeah. And I had a couple left. So this guy comes oh, in yeah. and I said, hey, by the way, we got a couple of special wine. I got a couple of special wines downstairs that are our wine list. Right. And we only offer them to special mm -hmm. guests. I could have really used that last night. I want to know. The Saturday. Wait, yeah, you just did it. I sat because it. Carly went and did it. Well, Carly did it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. You need a little more season. Yeah. Well, I could have just said, like, we have some special ones. But that's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, that, what I'm talking about. That would be on us. We should probably order like about five or six special That'd wines. That would be cool. That would be cool. You should always, yeah, it's like if you go to, if you guys ever go to a wine tasting <laughs> and you go up to the table and they have six or seven wines on the table and you say, what do you have under the table for yeah. the trade? Oh, you say that every that. time. You we, say that every time. We haven't done that when we do these trade wine tastings. Yeah. You know, another thing, remember cleaning piano? Yeah, I remember of it, but I, I never went there that often. But yeah. big famous restaurant. The chef was Pete. He was around forever. And if you knew him, you could order what's called the feast. There you go. So you would go in there, and you'd say, well, I want the feast. And the feast was whatever it was a five-course meal, whatever he had going that day. So you'd start off with this appetizer, this salad, this meat, this fish, this dessert. And, like, the price was ridiculous, but nobody cared. Right. Because... Got. This is your special meal. Basically, yeah. right. yeah. and you could only like, order that. The servers would never say, "Do you want the feast?" No. So they would say something. Like, you know, if they saw you two or three or four times, you know, it, it would get out a little bit. And yeah. These people would come back all the time. That's exactly what I'm and talking about. Getting a thirty dollars yeah. dinner, it would be like hundred dollars. Yeah. That'd be so cool. Get on it. Let's go. That'd be so cool. We did that at one. That was awesome. How does, how does it play out? Well, we just have like a, a special, special appetizer. No, just come in. We come in and say to the server, can we get the feast coming? And say, well, you know, yeah, do you know Pete? Yeah, we know Pete. Tell him so and so's out here. And they would play this little game. They'd mm -hmm. go back in. Tom Grassy's out here. He wants to get the feast. Okay. The, fish, the server come back out. Okay. Pete's got time. He'll take care of it. There you go. Yeah. I, I did or did it get out into the public? Well, because it's just Pete, a couple uh, people. Yeah, like like you never it. went there and got the feast alone, like right? No, you always no. went with people yeah, and you got it's the like feast. Anything else. Yeah. When you go to a restaurant and you have a good experience, you tell two or three people. If you have a bad experience, you tell ten. So we would have that experience, and I'd say, you, hey, guess what I went to dinner last night? Cleveland Pete, oh, man, they, they have, we have this feast that yeah. nobody else gets. It's, on, it's not yeah. on the menu. We're just like, here, bottle of wine. You know, we could have some bottles of wine and, and things that you would tell other people and they'd come in and say, hey, a friend of mine came here and they got this sink. They said it was great. And they said they had, you guys have like some five special bottles of wine for someone. So, how does it get out? It just slowly transfers out, but that's like a claim to fame. You know, people are going to come here because of that right. Right. little nuance. Of, oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, they used to do it at Blue Point all the time. Interesting. So yeah. if you had a friend coming in, like you always do, you could maybe like drop it to a friend or if you have like regulars that you've seen yeah. for like six, well, here, we have, six we weeks in a row. A customer comes in every Sunday, every Sunday yeah. for the specials. He's on our email list and that's what you guys are going to do. We're going to take that little thing and we're going to pay you guys X amount of money for every email address that you get. So we have like 2,500 names in our email list. That's great. And a lot of people come here just because of the specials. We have one guy. Scott and his wife come every Sunday. Wow. And I will email him once in a while and say, hey, give me a special that you like. Or I'll have some customers. Like there weekend, you go. We got, I got an email. They saw Chicken and Latino posted on a Facebook post. So she sent me an email. Wow, this, this special looks awesome. So I said, hey, thanks for the email. Guess what? We'll have that special following weekend so you can step by. Have but back to Scott, what I'll tell Chef is, hey, Scott's coming in and he always gets the short rib, so make sure you save him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A short rib. Right. This time they got two. Yeah. So okay. cool yeah, things like that. Yeah. And, and, and he always had, I put the um, his bottle of wine on his spot, and that's it. His, I'm a okay. call. I thought he just came in for No, every Sunday. We every have Sunday dinner together. Give him his bed coming. 
four thirty. Yeah. Karen is void. So those are the type of regular easy. customers you can get. <coughs> that's how us. And that's how David do some of these more these other promotions and stuff. They've been going right. for seven years. Right. Um, do we have time to do the bottle opening still? Uh, if you guys want to stay.